So So what is this set? Well, this is the set of rationals whose square is strictly less than 3. Describe with mathematical symbols a set of reals whose inverses are between 1 and 2. So we want the set of reals whose inverses are between 1 and 2. Okay, just interrupt me when you have a question, you don't understand my solution. The set minus 1, 5, this is the set of reals strictly between minus 1 and 5. Uh, number 3. So we assume that so what, x is less than y, and okay. So then uh, we so let me see what we are going to use here. Okay, so that's what I want to do. So the first step would be to get, okay, um, x minus x bigger than y minus x, so you get 0 bigger than 1 minus x. And then uh, you can, no, I don't want to do that. So what I want to do next OK. So now we are assuming that z is negative. So minus z must be positive. And uh, we can use uh, one of the rules here, uh, O4. And that tells me that y minus x times minus z is positive. Therefore, uh, we, now we use a distributivity property. That's y minus yz plus xz positive, and we end up with xz bigger than yz. Of course, all, all these things now you are going to use without justifying. I mean, you multiply by a negative, you reverse your inequalities. You, it's just to show you from where these things come, and once you give yourself a uh, a set of rules how you get the other ones. Okay, this is the same type of thing. Number four A. So we know that x is less than y, which is negative. Uh, by the preceding problem, we know that x times x must be bigger than x times y. Okay, I'm multiplying by a negative, uh, so, I'm, so maybe I should write it uh, like this. If 
for x is less than y. This implies that x times x is bigger than x times y, which means that x squared is bigger than xy. And then, of course, we do the same thing with uh, uh, y. So we get xy bigger than y squared. And now we put together x squared bigger than xy, which is bigger than y squared. I by, by transitivity of uh, this uh, ordinary relation, we get, so we put together these two, this and that, and together they imply that x squared is bigger than y squared. Now, B, so we know that um, X and Y are negative again, which means that XY is positive. And so we have X less than Y. And then we multiply by a positive number. And we get 1 over Y less than 1 over X. Okay. Number five. So uh, we get a less than one. We know that x is positive or zero. So for so we can write ax strictly less than x for positive x. And we know that a times 0 is 0 for x equals 0. So now we can put both inequalities together and say that ax is less than or equal to x for x larger than or equal to 0. OK? B, we want to show that x over a is bigger than x. So because we have that a is between 0 and 1, we know that 1 over a is bigger than 1 over 1, which is 1. OK, the inverse function is a decreasing function on the positive and on the negative. Now we multiply across by x, x over a is larger than x for x positive. Again, we do the same trick as here. If uh, it's a 0, we get a 0. So we can put equality. And this is true for all x positive. This time, what we need is to say that since x is larger than 0, x plus 1 is larger than 1. So 1 over x plus 1 is smaller than 1. And x over x plus 1 is less than x times 1, which is x. OK, 9 is about absolute values.
Okay, so we want to show inequalities with absolute values. This calls for the triangular inequality. Okay, so you use a triangular inequality in uh, several ways, but uh, one, one way is to start with A and write this like this. Okay, you can write that A is minus A minus B plus B. You are doing nothing here by, but introducing this minus B plus B. But this allows you to use the triangular inequality for these two numbers. And then you get this inequality, so which is what we wanted. Now for B, you are going to do the reverse. You're going to start with B and write that B is this. Again, triangular inequality, this is B minus A plus A. And therefore, B minus A is less than uh, B minus A in absolute value. Of course, uh, A minus B is the same as B minus A in absolute value. Okay? This is the opposite of that. Opposite numbers have the same absolute value. 2 and minus 2 have the same opposite value. So we uh, we get uh, the two inequalities we wanted. And finally, for C, uh, we use these two inequalities. Okay? So by uh, A and B, we have that, um, so what do we have? We have that B minus A, um, right. B minus A is between uh, A minus B and, uh, no, it's the same one. Yeah. Okay, and the opposite of, uh, no, that's not what I want. Let's see what's going on here. B minus A is more than A minus B. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to use the lemma, so what I want to say is that A minus B actually, okay, so that's what I want to say is that A minus B is, so A minus B we say it here is a smaller than absolute value of A minus B. Okay, this inequality comes from here. And now, this inequality is the same as saying that A minus B is bigger than minus B minus A. Right, I'm just multiplying this inequality by minus 1. So I get A minus B, and I get minus B minus A. So uh, we put here minus B minus A. And now, uh, so that's the lemma of this section. The lemma says the following. Yeah, the lemma on page 5 says that The absolute value of x is less than a if and only if x is between minus a and a. Right? So we use the lemma with these numbers here. Okay? Think of this guy as being a. Now let's maybe write this with a capital A here so that there is no confusion. 
So this is my capital A, so minus A plus A, and this is my X. So I have shown that my X is between minus A and A, which is equivalent to absolute value of X less than A. Okay? So according to the lemma, what we get from here is that the absolute value of A minus B, or should write absolute value of X, which is absolute value of A minus absolute value of B, is less than capital A, but my capital A is A minus B. So uh, you don't really need to memorize these things, but they will come up. But the way you use this is by using triangular inequality and using this trick here, which is quite useful. Okay, that's something you need to think to do when you have inequalities to prove with absolute values. This is done. Uh, 11. Eleven. Uh, so we have that x is between a and b, and y is between way, uh, y is between a and b as well. But then I can multiply my my two inequalities here by minus one and get the reverse inequality. So I get that x is between a and b and minus y is between minus b and minus a. Right, when I multiply by minus 1, I get minus a bigger than minus x bigger than minus b. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing, that's all. Now I can add across these inequalities to get this. So this is going to be, or yeah, I should do So this is B minus A. So we end up with X minus Y between minus B minus A and plus B minus A. So that's again uh, a lemma uh, situation where you have a number between two opposite numbers. So by the lemma, it means that the absolute value of x minus y must be less than b minus a. So you must be very comfortable with absolute values, with uh, triangular inequalities, because that's basically what we'll be doing the whole semester. That's, that's the main tool. So if you have any question about these problems, uh, ask questions because you'll need that. 12. So here there are several ways to do this. Uh, one good starting point, actually, is to start with by writing that your x is between minus 1 and 2. Uh, and then multiply by 1 over y, which you know is positive. Okay, it's better than doing the reverse, where you don't know what the sign of x is. So you multiply by uh, 1 over y, and you get minus 1 over y, x over y, 2 over y. And now you use what you know about y to get an upper bound and a lower bound. So you know that y is bigger than, one, uh, bigger than 3, for instance, which means that 1 over y is smaller than 1 third. Well, we won't, OK? And so 2 over y is less than 2 third. So that gives me an upper bound. And then for minus 1 over y, it's also uh, useful to start with this one. You don't use the 4, actually. 
in this problem. Because if you start with y bigger than 3, then again 1 over y is less than 1 third. And minus 1 over y is bigger than minus 1 third. Okay, you want something bigger than here. Okay, there, they, this is not the only solution. If you found that x over y is between minus 100 and plus 100, that's correct too. That's not as good, but it's correct. Okay, so there are many possibilities here. No problem. The only thing is you need to show your, you need to have logical implications showing your bounds. Okay. Plugging a few x and y's and guessing is not acceptable. Okay, so there is a typo in my notes. It should be a large inequality, not, not a strict one. I hope you didn't spend the night uh, showing a strict one because it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a true statement. If you plug in x equals 0, you get equality. Yes? Okay, so if we just said that if you plug in x equals 0 and it breaks at the end? Yeah, yeah that's, that's the way to, to do it. Okay, so if you do that, then you have, so what? We are trying to show, okay. So we want, we, we get here 1 plus x plus x squared, less than 1 over 1 minus x. And we can do that because x is less than 1. So 1 minus x is a positive number, okay? When you are dividing across inequalities, always ask yourself, can I do that? Do I know the sign of this thing? If not, then you, you cannot do it. So we get the inequality, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the generalization is uh, simply to say, well, but this algebraic inequality is true for any n. OK, so we can do 1 minus x times 1 plus x plus x squared plus xn equal to 1 minus xn plus 1. And that's also la less than 1 because you are subtracting a positive number to 1. And therefore, uh, you get that 1 plus x plus x squared plus xn is less than 1 over 1 minus x. So you can do it for any n. Again, this is a question of taste. Uh, there are many other generalizations, maybe, and, uh, and that's fine. The generalization means only that you are proving something that includes the previous result. Uh, actually, this, what's interesting about this thing is that this, uh, in the limit, when you add infinitely many of the powers, you get exactly 1 over 1 minus x. But what this is showing us is that when you stop at the n, well, you are, you are approximating from below your function. That's what you are doing. Okay, 14. There isn't much really in 14. It's just a question of using, uh, again, the, the algebraic identity. So we know that 
xn minus yn is x minus y times xn minus 1 plus xn minus 2y plus over way to x, y, n minus 2 plus y, n minus 1. That's what uh, the identity we saw tells us. And so you do the same thing with 1 and a. So you get 1 minus a, n equal to 1 minus a times uh, 1 plus y uh, plus a. Plus, uh, actually, I want n plus 1, right? I want n plus 1. So I'm going to do n plus 1 instead of uh, n. And so I have everything here is, uh, has, is uh, shifting by 1. So I get 1 plus a plus a squared. And my last power is a n. And that gives me exactly what I want. OK, let me maybe write it at what I'm using here is this formula where n is shifted by 1. OK, that's all I'm using. I'm using the formula for n plus 1 instead of n. Questions? OK, so 1.2. Number 5. So we want a formula for the sum of the first n even naturals. And uh, because we know that 1 plus 2 plus n is n over n plus 1 over 2, if we do 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 2n, we get 2 times 1 plus 2 plus n, which is 2 times what we have here, n, n plus 1 over 2, which gives me n over n plus 1, n times n plus 1. So that would be the formula for the first n in even integers. Okay. This is almost a proof. But since uh, uh, we are doing induction, let's, uh, let's do it by induction. Okay, but that's how you would guess what your formula is, and it's you, you could argue that this is actually a proof of a formula, since the other one has been proved already. So the hypothesis we we want, the statement we want to check is that for every n for all naturals and uh, 2 plus 4 plus all the way to 2n is n times n plus 1. That's what we want to prove. Now, um, so let's give it a name. Let's call this thing en for even. And uh, this is a n. And let's compute e1. e1 is 2. OK, we stop at the first term. And a1 is 1 times 2, which is 2 as well. So we get that e1 is equal to a1. Then we assume that the induction hypothesis is true for n. Assume that En is equal to An. 
and let's show that EN plus 1 is then equal to AN plus 1. So EN plus 1 is 1, uh, no, it's not 1, 2 plus 4 plus 2N plus 2N plus 1. But we are assuming that EN is AN. This is EN plus 2 times N plus 1. E, uh, AN is N, N plus 1 plus 2 times N plus 1. So we get N plus 1 factor of N plus 2, which turns out to be exactly AN plus 1. Okay, but I have used my induction hypothesis and I have shown that when I use the induction hypothesis to the following and I, I add one term that I need to get my EN plus 1, I do get AN plus 1. Okay, so there is a little bit of work to be done always in this step. And now my conclusion is by induction, by the induction principle, En is An for every n. Seven was a sign as well, right? Okay. So A, the maximum of A, so we say that uh, L is the maximum of A if L belongs to A and L is an upper bound of A. B, if A is non empty, does maximum of A necessarily exist? What did you answer to that? No, that's not enough because it, uh, maximum must mean that it's in the set. But, yeah, but it, can't be in, it can't be the least upper bound unless it is in the set. Why is that? No. Like, if you take uh, uh, an interval like 0, 1, your least upper bound is 1 and is not in your set. But what you're saying is true for integers. If you do have, if it's a subset of integers and you have a least upper bound, then it's a maximum. You can, you can show that. That's because it's discrete, so there's no way to, to get that close without being in. <laughs> yeah, you need, you need to, because uh, in general, least upper bound is not in the set. It's not a maximum. But of course, in this question, I, I ask you to imagine a definition, so it's, uh, you can be creative. So what did you answer to the second question? No. 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 And the, what did you do to show it? It was no. But we are talking about... Uh, set of integers, but it's that's that's one example. Uh, if, but if you want integers, just take a to be n, and of course this is not empty and uh, it uh, it's it has no maximum. Okay, if it had a maximum, it would contradict the Archimedean property. Uh, now, if we have, so this also something. So if A is included in B, 
then uh, we can say that uh, so maximum of A belongs to A, which is included in B, which implies that maximum of A must be smaller than maximum of B. Because all the elements of B are less than the maximum of B. So once I know that my maximum is in A, it's necessary for it to be also less than the maximum of B. Okay, that's, and of course, the inequality may be strict if, uh, in, well, depending on, on which case. Okay, so now number eight. So our starting point is R irrational between 0 and 1. Okay. Uh, and so we can say that uh, R certainly has a representation A over B where A and B are naturals. Okay, that's uh, how we define rationals. It must have a representation. Uh, the reason why A and B are natural is because R is a positive number. And uh, so that's our starting point. Now, the, the point here is to show that my uh, representation may be irreducible. Okay, maybe, uh, meaning that A and B have no common divisors. And of course, intuitively, it's clear because if I have something which is reducible, well, I reduce it. And if I need to reduce it again, I do it again. And after a finite number of steps, I'm going to get something irreducible. So intuitively, that's clear. But when you are giving this type of argument that you need to do something a certain number of times, uh, the number of times being finite, you are using the well-ordering principle. That's what you are doing without saying it. So that's why we, I just wanted to give you an application of the well-ordering principle. But intuitively, it's clear that uh, we do have an irreducible form. OK, so we look at the set. So the set A is the set of naturals for which n times r belongs to the naturals. So that's my set A. You see that my set A depends on what R is. Again, intuitively, the ones that are going to work are the multiples of B, for instance. But not only. Uh, if, if you reduce it, you'll have more, more terms in, in your set. Anyway, so you, we want to use the, to, in order to show that uh, the minimum exists, uh, we have one tool, and that's the well ordering principle. Okay, so let's try to apply that. First thing, A is not empty. It's not empty for what reason? B is in this set, okay? Since BR is B times A over B, which is A, which is a natural. Okay, so this means that B belongs to A. 2B belongs to A as well, 3Bs and so on. But B is the simplest one. Okay, questions on this step? Now that we know it's not empty, the well-ordering principle applies, okay? So we have A non-empty, A in the naturals. So these are the two hypotheses. By the well-ordering principle, this gives me that minimum of A exists.
So the minimum we call M. And second question, let's define K as being M times R. Then the question is, why is K a natural? Well, it's a natural because since M belongs to A, we know that uh, MR is a natural, which means that K is a natural. So we are only using the fact that we know that the minimum is in the set. That's all. And now C show that K and M have no uh, common divisors. So this will give us a reducible form because we'll write R as in K over M and K over M have no common divisor, which was our objective. So we can do a proof by contradiction. Assume that we have a D bigger than 2 so that k is k prime d and m is m prime d. Okay, so we do prove by contradiction. We have a common divisor, which is a number, a natural number d. Okay, this must be natural. Then uh, what happens is that if we compute M prime R, uh, we get so what is M prime? Uh, Okay, so we can write that. Well, or we can write things a little differently. We can write that R is K over M, which is also K prime D over M prime D, which is also K prime over M prime. Uh, here, too, I should have said that K prime and M prime are naturals. Okay, this, this, this visibility stuff, you always need to be working with uh, naturals, otherwise it doesn't make sense. So once we have this, we get that K prime is M prime R, and that's a natural. Because K prime is a natural. And therefore, M prime belongs to A. OK, because A is the set of uh, naturals so that N times R belongs to A. So we have this here. However, M prime must be strictly less than M, which is the minimum of A. M prime is strictly less than M because of this, right? M is written as M prime times D, where D is a number bigger than 1. So M prime is less than M. We have, we have split M in two pieces, and M prime is one of them. So this is our contradiction. We have found a, an element of A which is smaller than the minimum of A. That's not possible. Therefore, K and M are relatively prime. And we're done. OK? Other questions on the homework?
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say a little bit uh, more about, uh, so this is, let's go back to 1.3 and uh, remember that the whole motivation for introducing the real numbers was that we hadn't enough numbers in the rationals and that in particular square root of 2 does not belong to the rationals. That was our uh, main motivation. And so we have, we, we have defined a set of numbers that we call the real numbers that have the fundamental property. And we have uh, observed that the fundamental property is not true for the rationals, in the sense that uh, we, we stated last time. Now, is this fundamental property enough to ensure that square root of 2 is part of a new set? Okay, that's, uh, that's the issue here. Or do we need something even bigger than this? And uh, so the, the important result here is the following one. Uh, take a real number. then the, the equation x squared equal a has exactly one, one positive solution. denoted by square root of a. So the answer to my question is yes. In the reals, you have one positive, I should say here, real solution. You have a solution. You square root of 2 is a real. Okay, there is a solution to the equation x squared equal to inverse. And that's thanks to the fundamental property of variables. So we, we are going to talk a little bit about the proof. First thing about uniqueness. Why can I say that there is exactly one solution? Well, if x squared is a and y squared is a, so x and y are solutions of this equation, then I can subtract the two and get that x squared minus a squared is 0, which means that x minus y times x plus y is 0, which means that x is y or x is minus y. So once I have a solution y, any other solution is either y or minus y, which means that at most I have one positive solution. Okay, I cannot have two. Okay, so this shows that we have one positive solution at most. At most because at this point we haven't proved that we have one. Okay, but what we show is that if we have two, then they are either equal or opposite. Now the existence, the existence of a solution comes from a fundamental property of variables. And so we need to define a set appropriately, 
that will have a least upper bound or a greatest lower bound, and that uh, least upper bound will turn out to be exactly the solution of x squared equal a. Okay, so that's uh, how we proceed. So we define a set. So let's let's do it. Uh, let's do a particular case a equal two. Okay, we are looking specifically for square root of two, not square root of a. It it's a little bit more concrete. Then define the set A as being the reals that have a property. Well, let's, let's look only at the positive numbers. And x squared less than 2. We could take another set. We could take x squared bigger than 2, of course. Now, the thing is to try to get as close as you want. The thing is we need to have square root of 2 in our boundary. That's what we need. Okay? So here we approach square root of 2. That's what we're doing as our x increases. Now, in order to use the fundamental property of the reals, which hypothesis do I need to check? When does a set have a great uh, least upper bound? What do we need to apply the fundamental property of the rails? So these properties you need to know by heart. Okay, we're all doing principle. When can I apply it? What's the result? Fundamental property, Archimedean property. All these things you need to memorize. There are not that many, but uh, the ones that have a name you need to memorize. Yes? Yeah, you want an upper bound, but and you also want to show that it's not empty. Okay? So the fundamental property simply says the following. If my set is not empty, and if the, it has an upper bound, then it has a least upper bound. So why is it non-empty? One belongs to this set. Okay, one to the square is less than two, and therefore one belongs to the set. The set is not empty. Now, uh, what about upper bounds? Two. So let's show, for instance, that two is an upper bound. If x is bigger than two, then x squared is bigger than four, and x does not belong to a. OK? So if x is bigger than 2, x is not in a. If I use the contrapositive of this, I get that if x, well, tell me what the contrapositive is. What's the contrapositive of this thing? If x is in a, then yeah, let's uh, let's forget about this guy here and just x bigger than two implies x not in a. So we would say if x is in a, then x is less than or equal to two. So by looking at the contrapositive, I see that this little computation has given me an upper bound because every x in a is less than 2. OK? So 2 is an upper bound.
which means by the fundamental property of the rails, there is a great slow, uh, there is a least upper bound in it. And that's the fundamental idea here, is that because of the fundamental property, you get the existence of a number. And then you work to show that that number is really, it gives you equality here. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a big mistake. Thank you. It's always in the reals. And it's not in, the, in A here. Because we don't want it in A, we don't want strict inequality. We want that m squared is equal to 2. OK, so now the, the following steps uh, are so let's give it a name. Uh, M, okay, so the least upper bound that we call M. Now, what the, the objective is, is to show that M squared is actually 2. And then we are done. Okay, because we have found the solution uh, in. It must be positive because it's an upper bound of this set. It cannot be negative. It's a, it's a set of uh, positive numbers. And uh, so what we do, and this takes a little time. We're not going to do everything. Uh, what you do to show this is, well, actually, there are three possibilities when I, have a, uh, when I want to compare two numbers like this. Either m squared is strictly less than 2, or it's strictly bigger than 2 or it's equal to 2. So the way this thing works is to rule out m squared 3, 3 less than 2 and m squared 3 bigger than 2. When you rule out these two, you are left with m squared equal to 2 and you're done. Okay. So we need to rule out two things. Actually, let's rule out m squared bigger than 2. There are a little less computations. You seem a little worn out already. So let's rule out this one. The other one uses the same type of ideas, but with a little bit more excitement in the middle. So uh, we want to rule out this guy. Well, we are going to do the following. set epsilon equal to m squared minus 2 over 4m. I hope I know what I'm doing. And then let's compute m minus epsilon squared. Well, we write m squared minus 2m epsilon plus epsilon squared. And then uh, we are going to say that this is bigger than m squared minus 2m epsilon. Why can I say this? Yeah, it's only epsilon squared. So I'm getting rid of a positive term. Therefore, of course, I get something smaller. 
Okay, so we can do that. Now let's use our beautiful epsilon here that we have defined in advance. Of course, I would first I first did the computation and then I decided what my epsilon should be. But anyway, let's um, let's do it here. So we get m square minus two m m square minus two over four m. So the m's cancel, and we have a 2 here. And we end up with m squared. So let's, let's rewrite the inequality. We have m minus epsilon squared bigger than uh, m square minus m square minus 2 over 2, which is m square plus 2 over 2. Okay, so that's the midpoint of m square and 2, and that's why I picked my epsilon like that to get the midpoint. And the point is the following. Uh, m square, we are assuming, so we are doing a proof by contradiction here, okay? We are assuming this, okay, by contradiction, assume that m square is bigger than 2, okay? We want to rule out this. We want to show that that's not possible. So we are assuming that 2 is here, m square is here, my midpoint is here. So, of course, this is strictly bigger than 2. Now, remember that my A Remember that my A is the set of reals so that x squared is x is positive and x squared is less than 2. Now, uh, we do the same thing we did before where we say the following, well, if um, yeah, if x is bigger than m minus epsilon, then x square is bigger than m minus epsilon square, then, uh, which is bigger than 2 according to my uh, computation here, which implies that uh, x does not belong to a. Okay, so we do exactly what we did for 2 to show that 2 was an upper bound. So this exactly, you take the counterpositive now, and you say if x belongs to A, then x is smaller than or equal to m minus epsilon. So because of this argument here, m minus epsilon is an upper bound. Why is this a contradiction? Yes. M is our least upper bound. We have found uh, an upper bound which is less than M. Uh, of course, this works only because our epsilon is, is this guy here, and we are assuming that M square is bigger than 2. Okay, if, you, if you start having negative epsilons, which I don't recommend, uh, you you start you know you don't you haven't proved anything. Okay, so that's to rule out m square bigger than two, and uh, you can read m square to rule out m square less than two. It's very similar. It's uh, the algebra is a little worse uh, for some reason, or maybe I I was a little worse when I did the this side. Anyway, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. But uh, uh, it's not very, very difficult. So this finishes chapter one. And 
Tuesday we have no class for some reason and uh, we'll go back on Thursday. So I have assigned homework for next Thursday which is in chapter in 1.3, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, so we are getting to uh, already to important stuff, you know. Don't, uh, I mean, you, you need to understand these things pretty well. In particular, these notions of least upper bound and fundamental property and so on. You need to memorize the properties and you need to be able to redo computations of this type on your own without looking at the notes. Okay, so you, you need to, to make sure you, you do all this to be on top of things. Okay, so let's stop here. Homework. <laughs>